Uh, welcome to Pilecki Institute. Um, I have to tell you, I was looking forward to this discussion all the week, uh, mainly for two reasons. The first reason uh, is that sitting next, next to me. Uh, I think we have um, a wonderful panel with a very special and um, interesting characters. I shortly want to introduce uh, the, the three guys sitting next to me. We have uh, the award-winning filmmaker Roman Bondarschuk, right pronunciation? <laughs> Good. Um, we have Daria, Daria Avershenko, producer, is correct? Yes. And we have um, Dimitro Bachnenko. Dimitro, it's um, very special that Dimitro is sitting next to us. Uh, Dimitro is like an active soldier in the Ukrainian army. Uh, Dimitro told me it was very hard for him to get here today to take part of um, this discussion. Um, but he managed to do it and um, yeah, he will be joining us today for, for our discussion. The second reason for my joy about the panel is that I'm a war reporter. Uh, I've been covering the war in Ukraine for about six months in the last two years. And Kherson is the place which I connect with very, very special and strong moments. Um, I think we have some pictures here um, behind me. Um, the first pictures is, uh, I want to show are from the liberation of Kherson. Now you see the Kachovka disaster. But the first very special moment I had was November 2023, when me and my team were arriving in Kherson city and everybody was celebrating. There were people smiling, people with their flags, with Ukrainian flags in the city center, people crying, family reunions. Um, after a month of Russian occupation, Ukrainian forces liberated the city and Kherson was Ukrainian again, and uh, Russian forces had to retreat to the other side of the, the Dnieper River. And what you see now behind me is actually June 2023, six months after the liberation of Kherson city. You all followed the news uh, about the Kachovka disaster, the explosion of Kachovka and the floods in the city. And we were standing and reporting from a, fl from a flooded uh, city. And there were not only the floods, there were, was the shelling, um, people losing their homes, destroyed existence, um, and like a lot of like, uh, rescuers who, who did an amazing job and who saved many lives back then. So we want to discuss today about uh, the fate of Kherson and of course about um, your movie too. Uh, it's all connected. And I would like to start with uh, you, Daria. Um, I learned yesterday from Roman that your parents still live in Kherson city. Maybe you can tell us uh, how is the current life in Kherson for everyone who has no idea how it is to live in the city at the moment? Um, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's really a sad topic because uh, uh, Kherson, it's, uh, now it's half destroyed city. I mean, uh, uh, like uh, nobody expected this uh, after uh, the occupation, but now it's uh, like this. Uh, Kherson is under heavy shelling, and every day somebody is dying there. Um, but uh, from the other hand, uh, so many people came back uh, and uh, mm, uh, brought their children. Uh, so, like many people, you know, they don't have enough uh, social connections to uh, to stay abroad or to stay in safer place. Or, don't have enough uh, money. It's so banal, but it's like this. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, family issues. Uh, somebody has like old parents, old grandparents at home, and they should be cared. So, like, uh, uh, still, there is uh, a life in Kherson, and uh, uh, like working hospitals, uh, shops, uh, gasoline stations. Uh, I mean. 
uh, but uh, uh, like nobody knows uh, what future will bring and uh, the Russians, you know, they're targeting uh, not only infrastructure, but also bus stops, uh, where civilians just trying um, uh, uh, to get to their work. Mm. And uh, uh, it's something that, that you can't understand, that, that you can't accept. So my father, he's still there. Uh, he is a dentist, and uh, he thinks that uh, he should uh, he should be there with his people and serving civilians because uh, every town every town uh, should have uh, uh, their doctors and people who uh, who help. Uh, who, who, who help other people like uh, it's his philosophy and he's like this but uh, some days ago um, uh, the, the rocket uh, killed his neighbor and uh, yeah it, like it, like just ordinary walk not far from for, uh, from the house and uh, uh, it, 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 uh, the things that I, I don't know uh, you can't get used to it, you know. But still, uh, he's very stubborn, and he wants to to to, to be uh, to be there till the like peaceful times uh, will come. Mm. I would like to add that there is still like a brewery uh, even operating in Kherson. When we have been the last time there, uh, we were able to buy some beer for souvenirs in, in Kherson. And this uh, brewery is, is, is heavily shelled too, like a couple of times. This is everyday life. Thirteen kinds of beer they still brew, uh, brew there, and I was also surprised because I, I was there in uh, uh, it was o August, yeah, August twenty three when, when it was flooded, and it was like difficult to get uh, just a sweet water, but uh, still they were selling thirteen kinds of beers, local beers, and I said, wow, and they said it's our duty, it's our form of resistance. And um, uh, they also uh, have a roastery, coffee roastery, and there is a barista who can give you quite a proper coffee there. So people resisting on their level and as the hard as they can, yeah. And the barber shop, I, I, I don't remember the barber shop. L like uh, they're driving from the uh, district to district and uh, serving people who want to. Uh, to make a haircut, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so life is going on despite shelling, despite everything. And maybe for the understanding of, of, of everyone here, the, the Dnipro River is really the natural front line, yeah? So you have the the, the Russian controlled side and you have the Ukrainian controlled side. And when we were doing interviews in Kherson at, at the river, uh, like they told us the snipers can see you if they want. It's like a few kilometers. So this is like, this is daily life still in Kherson. Uh, liberation in Kherson, uh, in, in, in Ukraine in general, does not mean freedom and peace. Um, they think this is one, one thing we can say about Kherson. Um, Dimitro, you even lived in Kherson after Russian troops took over in 2022. I just learned it yesterday and I saw that you filmed secretly what was going on under occupation. Uh, there was a video, or like a small documentary on BBC. Uh, watched it yesterday, very impressive. Can you tell a little bit about how was it be to live under occupation? Um, I saw that you've been there with your um, family, with your, with your child. How was it? Can you, can you tell us a little bit? And how did you manage to get out of the city finally? Uh, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was hard. Uh, it was like, it feel like sky press at you. Uh, you cannot, um, um, you cannot do something uh, normally. I mean, uh, in any minutes, uh, some Russian soldiers can, can ask you anything, can check your passport on the checkpoint, or it's just no safety and no, no government, 
if if I can explain <laughs> what I mean, because uh, you you don't um, in in one time we have no uh, mobile phone uh, and no connection with by internet with world and. Uh, we cannot call to emergency, yes, uh, to police, because we have just no phone call. And I remember the situation when uh, some people drive on the central prospect of Kherson and uh, Russian soldiers on these big, uh, big cars, big uh, square, square or a ve ve vehicle. Yeah. Yeah, vehicle. Oh, okay, yes, on this military vehicle. Uh, just destroy, it's like, d destroy uh, cars with civilians mm -hmm. and go go straight somewhere. And people cannot call to the uh, medicine and just run few city blocks to the hospital to tell them that there is a big problem, few dead people. So it's it was a normal situation. <laughs> and how did you manage to get out of the city? When was it, and how did you? Uh, do it? it was in May. Uh, we. 2022. Yes, mm -hmm. in May 2022, uh, we drive out uh, through Zaporizhia region because it was the last way uh, f through some village, the last way from this uh, occupied territory. Yeah. Uh, to drive out to Ukraine or or through Crimea, but it wasn't a good idea for me because he was a journalist in Kherson, drive through Crimea. Uh, so it was two days uh, with big problems because my sister, uh, she was pregnant in this uh, time at seven months and I have children uh, she was five years old this moment, and uh, there is big a, a lot of quaver of people who want to drive out, and uh, a lot nobody. of checkpoints, right? Yeah, on the checkpoints uh, we have to this village in Zaporizhia region. I remember this <laughs> uh, thirty-six checkpoints. Wow. And controlled by Russian troops. Yes, and we drive all of them. Uh, big wave, and nobody can, uh, no rules, nobody can explain what you should do to what this guy with uh, gun, you need to go to have an answer on your question. How can we leave this, uh, this place? Mm. Oh, it was... Um, Interesting experience, mm. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, there were even like reports. We did report about that that there were systematic checks on these on these checkpoints by the Russian troops. Filtratia, filtration, uh, you call it. So some some especially men had really to take off all clothes, and if the the Russian troops saw a tattoo, for example, which they consider as a, a Nazi symbol or anything like this, this could have harsh consequences for... I know, can, can you, I, I know a situation when a guy um, from Kherson, uh, she's tried to go out and uh, on the passport uh, he had a photo uh, with Ukrainian national t-shirt, mm -hmm. Vyshevanka shirt, yes, and uh, when this Russian soldier saw this, uh, he take out him from the car to the bus station and said, "Why you, are are you Nazist or something like this?" He said, "No, it's just uh, short." Uh, they told, "Okay, we, now we we will kill you here because you are Nazist." I don't remember how he's uh, go out and uh, after he's drive to Odessa, go to army forces and. Uh, and he was uh, dead near Bakhmut in in October 2022. So it, it it was it was it's like a norma because you have no um, uh, no no rights. You have no rights with the situation. They can do everything what they want with you. Uh, can you pass the microphone to Roman? Roman. Um, when I'm correct, you left Kherson as a young man, so you grew up there, you were born there in Kherson too. You left being 19, correct? Yeah, about yeah. Uh, 19 to um, 
uh, I wanted to to enroll into the film school, and that's why I moved to Kiev, and Kiev. I succeeded. <laughs> you succeeded. Yes, you did, and you did a very very special. A movie, the editorial office. I had the chance to watch it. If if you didn't watch it so far, a big recommendation. Uh, very special uh, movie. Um, it was filmed the movie in the last free summer of Kherson, 2021, before the invasion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and one big topic is the beautiful nature uh, of Kherson and the endangered nature of Kherson. I wanted to ask you why. Kherson. I mean, you say it's still home, yeah? But why Kherson? Why do you come back as a filmmaker always to Kherson? Uh, what is, what make, does it make a, a special place for you? Well, it's uh, my hometown and uh, as every hometown it gives you some energy and inspiration and uh, it's uh, really difficult to stay away for a long time and uh, you just need this energy and uh, once you are there, once you step out from, from the train and from the car, you immediately feel yourself better. Uh, that's difficult to answer. Uh, I. I All my inspiration, all my stories uh, uh, are from there, and uh, all my people are there, so it's 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 quite natural. Mm. And the nature did it play like a big role for you, being being a, a young man or in your childhood too in Kherson? Of course, we are all very picky with the food because we are all from Kherson, and the food is amazing. It's a paradise, uh, agricultural paradise. It's like The um, the tomato are like average tomato is, is <laughs> the watermelons. <laughs> no, no, watermelons here is like tomatoes in in Kherson, <laughs> and uh, watermelons is like uh, I don't know. I have okay. no comparison to uh, watermelons. The grapes are this size, and uh, somehow it stays with you. <laughs> Get it? Yeah, and you came back for this for this movie too. Um, when we talked yesterday uh, on phone, you told me that for many years Kherson was for many people only like a, a train station uh, on the way to Crimea. Yeah, we know that Crimea is now under Russian occupation. When I travel Ukraine, I, I see always like a big difference between uh, the mentality of the people in Western Ukraine or more Western Ukraine and like in the Donbas in the eastern parts of Ukraine. Um, where you have uh, influence of, this, of the Soviet mentality like stronger and you can see it and you feel it too. How would you, uh, um, where, where is Kherson on this way? Mm. I, I like the story I told you yesterday by phone, but I, I, I'd like to repeat it. Uh, for uh, um, Donbass people, for the, the men of Donbass, uh, the the most successful uh, uh, solution in their life was to raise money in, in, the, in the pit, in the coal mine, and to move to the south and to marry a southern woman and to get his own uh, graveyard and to make his own wine and uh, enjoy the sun and this climate and this paradise. So there are many uh, couples and families uh, who are half Donbass, half uh, um, southern uh, region. So it's, it's kind of... Uh, it's much more uh, comforting than, than eastern Ukraine, for me at least. But... Uh, Uh, maybe Vadim, he is from, from Donetsk and he believes that it's the most beautiful place on the earth and probably he can argue. Vadim is the man behind the camera here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's the DOP. The DOP. Um, I think you, it was your first main role as an actor, yeah? The editorial office. Um, can you tell us a little bit how Did Roman, or I don't know who it was, came up with the idea that, that you do this main role? And um, I heard that you took a lot of lessons, like private lessons before. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, why I am on the main role, maybe it's a better question to Roma. Um, I can translate if you need, uh, just if you have any ideas. Any ideas? Okay. Yeah, why? <laughs> okay. Um, 
because before I don't have moustache, maybe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, yes, I have a private, private license because I'm not professional actors. And um, maybe some, some natives and uh, some, some natives wh which I had is it, it, it was a reason, one of the one of the reasons, maybe because uh, uh, because we are uh, similar, a little bit similar or with uh, uh, with Jura. Uh, and it's sometimes for me it's not 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 what was not difficult to to understand why he will do this or, and not this, uh, but uh, when you are when you play in a project of this uh, masthab of this size, yes, uh, um, you you just need to have some tools like an actor. I mean, you can speak normal, you can not play but live. Uh, on the shoot, and that's why uh, this crew, Roma, and producers uh, were thought that it's a good idea to do some actor courses, intensive, for me and for few actors too, uh, to fill this uh, life of Jura uh, and to. Immerse, immerse. To, to deep in, yes, to, to deep in inside. It was uh, five days, but it feels like a, uh, I open door in the, in the black room and I try to see what inside and try to feel what inside, try to find where is the light. Uh, what I find quite interesting, I didn't know about it until I, I talked yesterday with uh, Roman. You play in the movie, yeah? uh, a young reporter, uh, who films with his camera how men des destroy the nature in, in Kherson. And, I mean, this is fiction, yeah? <laughs> but you have been an investigative reporter in real life before in Kherson. And you uncovered people destroying the nature. You did stories about that. Can you tell us a little bit about this? So it's not the fiction. It's not only fiction. It's reality too. It's your old life. Yes, yes. It's my pre 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 before life. It was. Uh, I was working a beautiful newspaper in Kherson, and uh, what's I, the name? Uh, Vhoro. Vhoro. It's like uh, go up. Uh -huh. Get it? Yeah. Uh, is if translate. Uh, and. Uh, it was just interesting for me. Uh, started to uh, to wrote about uh, the people who destroy forests, and I remember it was uh, it was uh, after if if you remember Katerina Hanzuk, activist uh, who was murdered uh, because he is uh, uh, speak and wrote about the situation with destroyed forests too. Uh, and I started uh, to do some art, uh, some articles, few articles and few video about uh, the guy and how it's um, uh, how it's uh, connect with uh, uh, local government, local uh, municipality on the on the region. It it was a few articles. It changed uh, something <laughs> and. That's all. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit your perspective on this? Um, why did you choose this, like like these topics for this this film? Um, I mean, freedom of press um, is 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 a big topic too uh, in in times of war too. Um, maybe you can give us your side on on, on your your perspective on this too. Well, I. I I quit school when I was 14 and uh, joined to the uh, editorial office team as a photographer. So I have my personal experience, my personal stories and impressions from that age. And uh, it was quite um, a crazy place. They rented few rooms in the hotel 
uh, uh, to run the newspaper and it was like 10 people in the room just to, to, to make up some articles and uh, since that I was very uh, uh, attentive to journalism. Uh, also my parents, both of them, are were involved in, in journalism. So they, they also had uh, lots of story to tell. So, and uh, I, I like that it, in, in, in many ways we are inherited the Soviet tradition of, um, uh, of press uh, because uh, it was two different realities. One reality which was allowed to uh, write about and another reality which is quite difficult to to publish. So I, I wanted to discover this uh, difference between real reality and uh, reality in the media and uh, that's how we started to develop the script and uh, I invited Dima. I knew about his uh, investigations and he was quite a well-known person in, in the region because uh, the guys he uncovered uh, were already very angry and mad and they started to blackmail him and uh, they started a campaign against Dima and um, uh, there were many uh, fakes about him. Uh, it's funny but one of the biggest uh, fake they produced uh, was that uh, Dima is a gay. Uh, from their perspective is something like extremely terrible that uh, everyone has to hate him immediately because of that. Uh, so we started <laughs> uh, to, um, to develop the script and we started to record the um, uh, old generation of journalists and uh, new generation of, of, of local journalists and uh, that's how we became friends, I think, because uh, we recorded some videos together and then Dima stayed in Kherson. I returned to Kiev and uh, Dima just uh, kept sending me the transcriptions and uh, we had lots of interesting discussions. And when it came to the casting period, I realized that there is, well, I have Dima in my head, I, I have nobody else. and. We we casted and uh, we had many auditions and uh, we saw most of the actors who can be similar to Yura. But in the end, we decided to hire a coach and uh, send Dima to the classes and um, force him to quit journalism and um, uh, leave his social medias uh, behind and his smartphone as well and turn into another person. Yeah, and quite impressive, uh, really, how you did it. Um, freedom of press and corruptions are two topics which are still relevant when we talk about today's Ukraine. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of transparency, uh, so I cover not only the front lines when I'm in Ukraine, I cover st um, I cover corruption too uh, in military uh, on, on all other fears and it's very important because I think this differs Russia from Ukraine that you can speak about it, you should speak about it, yeah? You should do all these things transparent. Um, how do you... You are very demanding in this case. Yes, how do you assess the current situation and maybe um, you as like a former investigative reporter too, how is the situation, how free is press maybe also in times of war, or especially in times of war. Um, and what are the limits, maybe? Well, I, I think, if I may start, uh, I think that, that civil society in Ukraine is uh, strong enough to protect this right and to um, protect their independent media. And uh, at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the, the official... Uh, government, they started this marathon, so they um, uh, put together all the TV stations to produce like uh, information from one source and it, uh, it, it was quite a timely and practical idea at the beginning because like just to avoid misinformation and some uh, manipulation with, for, from the enemy. But uh, nowadays you can have your YouTube channel and it's, uh, 
you don't need like permission to have your media <laughs> and your audience. So I believe that uh, every attempt to um, to cross the line will be uh, will meet quite a big resistance. And I, I believe into Ukrainian civil society and. Uh, uh the our power is that we can always uh, say what we think and protest when we are not agree uh for example the this newspaper where i was work uh, it's still still um, in progress and uh, still work uh, and they are wrote and um anti-corruption uh, articles now still yeah, in the war. Mm. In the beginning of the war, mm, our government has closed this declaration because maybe some sensitive information for Russian spies and maybe they find something, <laughs> something terrible inside. Um, but uh, I know that now it's again open and um, um when when we ho when we have this um existential war mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard to explain uh to people uh, uh why wait uh, uh Ukrainian too no problem yeah. Yeah. okay um, yeah. uh, I, I, I will translate it. You can say it. It's just a I cannot uh, express yet what I mean inside, so th that's all what I want to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we got the point. Um, Maybe, Daria, maybe you can tell us once again, we showed the pictures of the consequences after the Kachovka explosion yeah, for Kherson. Can you tell um, to our uh, audience here, what does this mean for Kherson, the city, for Kherson, the region, in terms of agriculture, uh, nature, destruction, uh, and of course for the people? Um, I mean, we, we already talked about that you have still family ties to Kherson. Um, actually, it's an uh, ecological disaster, so uh, and, uh, like we call it ecocide, uh, because it changed uh, quite a lot and uh, mm, our ecosystem and uh, also there are more, like more than 80 uh, towns and villages uh, that were underwater after Russians uh, uh, exploded the, the dam. So, like, uh, uh, we lost our house because it's like it, it was a two-floor house. Uh, we used to live and celebrate all the family. Mm, uh, uh, <laughs> like, uh, all, all the celebrations uh, and uh, uh, got together. Uh, so, it was, like, uh, com completely de destroyed by water. And uh, uh, like all the districts in, in Kherson, they, they suffered really much. I mean, all the districts that uh, uh, were lower than city center, let's say so. But uh, city center was also underwater. Uh, you show the pictures. And uh, uh, so there are so many things to solve now. Uh, like uh, uh, probably you can Im imagine uh, uh, the mud and uh, uh, all the things that it can bring, I mean, the uh, bacteria and uh, like, if you're interested, uh, there is a lot of articles in, even in, uh, in foreign uh, media about uh, ecological disaster, just don't want to, to be really deep in details, uh, uh, but uh, like, uh, 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 the nature uh, should take time to recover. Like it's still possible, uh, but uh, it it will take years, years and years and years. 
I think you told me that your family lost a house too, right? In the in the floods. Yeah, yeah, we had the the, the house on the uh, opposite side of the river. There are it's a delta of Dnipro. There are many of uh, of islands, and uh, I think every family in Kherson had a house on on one of the islands. And uh, it was more practical to have a motorboat than uh, a car because uh, all the life was uh, there. The, the city itself, it was just to, to work. And uh, the whole life uh, of, of our Kherson people was on, on, the, on the water. So it, it was all like washed out and smashed into the Black Sea. And of course, it's still unclear if this water can be used uh, for like for uh, to drink or to, to, to for household and um, there is no fishing allowed because uh, no one knows how uh, what the quality of this fish and if it's safe to eat it and um, the same with the black sea because uh, all the mud and all the dirt went there and uh, it's 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 caused probably the the whole region and uh, um, I think it's 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 something uh, we still cannot understand and uh, uh, the 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 scope of the, the scale, the scale of dimension of it. Yeah, of it, yeah. Um, we will have like time to uh, answer your questions if you have any questions in the end. But before, I would like to. Um, take like a more general view on what's happening at the moment in Ukraine at the end. I told in the beginning that you are an active soldier. Um, you have been in eastern Ukraine in the in the last days, if I'm correct, yeah? Uh, on, on Monday, on the front lines. Um, how is it for you to be here to arrive on a sunny morning in Berlin in freedom and sitting here now on a panel with us? Uh, it's a big difference between uh, east of Ukraine and Kiev <laughs> because uh, it's a big difference and it's a big difference between uh, Kiev and Berlin. Here it's big contrast and uh, uh, first few days when we uh, drive here to, by by train. When you train here, uh, I was uh, in the these messengers because uh, my guys from my unit they are still there, and I am go to Berlin. It's it was so strange, and I chat with them. How I how, how are you? You need some help or anything else? Some volunteers help or everything? What can I do? Because I hear, and they are, they are there. They are still on the east. Um, it's just big, so big contrast, and uh, time for time it feels like some surrealism. Yes, because there is no, no strikes and no. Mm, Alert, alert, alert. Alert, yes, there is no alert. And <laughs> uh, yesterday when I heard this um, helicopters, yes, it feels strange. <laughs> yeah, to realize that you're not in a war zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like helicopters. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I know it's a big problem. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, I have it as a reporter when I come back after three weeks of, of, of uh, reporting in Ukraine, I, I need three or four days to get back to this reality here. But it's another dimension for you as a, as a soldier. Yeah, I, I, I will need a few days to get uh, to realize that I'm on the east, not <laughs> on the Berlin. <laughs> probably yes, probably yes. Unfortunately, we all know that <clears throat> the situation for the Ukrainian army on the battlefield is uh, critical at the moment. Um, the Ukrainian forces withdrew from uh, Avdivka uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, in the last 48 hours after a month of very, very intense fighting. And uh, Russia took over the, like, the action, the offensive on, on the battlefield at the moment after the counteroffensive last year. 
I would like to ask you, uh, and feel free, every, everybody of you, to, to answer, how would you assess the, the mood, the current mood of the society in Ukraine after almost two years of war? Just uh, extremely traumatized. And uh, th th there's just no other way uh, to go. We, we, we all have to resist and we all have to support the army with our donations or all kind of other actions with uh, everything we can. But uh, it feels like really hard. And uh, uh, the situation is getting harder and harder. As, uh, as far as I know, we are running out of ammunition and uh, we desperately need uh, international support. Otherwise, uh, I, I think it would be really hard to keep the enemies from at these positions where they are now. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's now uh, uh, something that uh, I read uh, uh, in uh, British media that, uh, uh, like, I don't know, the, the war is going uh, to spread over Europe uh, in the next two and three years. So, like, uh, um, <laughs> I, I think that it's very important message we should uh, uh, spread around here that uh, it's not only Ukrainian Russia war. Uh, I, I think it's it's much more bigger war that uh, like the whole Europe it's on, on the entrance. So and like uh, you, you should you should accept this and uh, help us uh, to win uh, because it's better to stop uh, it where it is now unfortunately uh, but yeah and I think that people uh, not only people in, in Ukraine depressed but Ukrainians abroad also they they have this uh, um, you know this uh, it has the uh, yes all, all, all these things and also the homesick of course so yeah um, <coughs> I, yes, I think um, important that uh, this war is touch everybody in Ukraine, whole family, we, everybody of us feel it because some of them lose friend or some relations, father, some of them lose house or uh, just need to go out, and we we all understand what will be if. Uh, uh, if we will not fight, because we we all remember Mariupol, for example, and still we are not there, and we all remember Kherson, what was in Kherson when it was under occupation, how terrible it was. Uh, we, a lot of us know people who were murdered, I know people who were murdered in prisons in Kherson, in Russian jail, or, yeah, it's correct? Yes. Uh, just because they were on this uh, protest meetings. Uh, I remember these meetings and it's just go some cars with Russians, they took anybody or started to fight on this. Uh, maybe after the beginning of the war, everything started to be so black and so white, and we all understand where is all, but we all understand in Ukraine where is the black and where is the white, and it's hard to when people started wanted to find some gray, you know, something in the middle. Maybe everything is not so. Uh, it's not, not not so obvious. Uh, maybe. We need started some conversation with them and all of this. <laughs> I, I just have a picture, you know, when yeah. when I when I hear this um, when I hear this uh, uh, this proposition, <laughs> I just have a lot a lot of pictures in my mind uh, what Russian uh, do made and will will do we'll in do. Ukraine. Yes. Before we open the discussion, one last question uh, for for you. Um, I think 
despite the fact that we have this this very critical situation now at the front lines, it's um, it's very good to have still some dreams. <laughs> So I want to ask you, maybe even in connection with Kherson or without Kherson, what is actually your personal dream for the time after war? Do you have something like this in mind? <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's, it's not very practical to live with your dreams and it's uh, distract you from, from this struggle and from your... It's it somehow relaxes you, and uh, it's uh, it's not uh, something we really need now. Uh, we have to accumulate and use our energy for this battle in all senses, and uh, then we will cope with the uh, dreams. Of course, we want to go back home to rebuild the the places we love. But uh, there will be lots of landmines and lots of um, ruins and uh, lots of people will never come back. Uh, that's something which also stops you from dreaming because it will be differently anyway. It's the same for you? Uh, no, no, I have a dream. <laughs> because so, ma so many people left uh, and... Uh, uh, so f so many people uh, um, uh, keep dying uh, uh, during the the battles, and so many intelligent people. Uh, I'm suffering uh, uh, like about this idea that so many not not professional militaries join the army, men and women. Uh, and uh, my personal dream to 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 come back and uh, study um, um, a documentary course for teenagers. Uh, to help them to um, to catch this reality, uh, to help them <coughs> uh, to raise professionally, to uh, improve their skills. Uh, it be, it's it's uh, like uh, it's because, f from one hand, it's because I'm mama. I have three children, and I understand so that uh, Ukraine will need uh, their teachers, their coaches. Uh, to raise a new generation uh, of uh, free people, and uh, like uh, I'd like uh, to to be useful in my profession. So well, it's my personal dream. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I try. <laughs> I try. You can speak in Ukrainian too, no worries. Yeah, or you can speak Ukrainian too. Ah, uh, no, yeah. okay. I I mean I I need to understand what I want to to, to Get tell. It. Yes. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I think it's it will not be like a border between war and peace. I mean, it's not like a, this is the war, dot, war, the end, and this is the peace. Because uh, so many people dead and so many cities and villages and territories destroyed. And I don't know, maybe we will cry so long for them because... Uh, as I feel, uh, people now don't want to uh, mm, reflexive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand? Yes, Re yes. Reflexive. W w w what? Uh, how much is it? How, how how terrible is it? We we can, but it's every day so terrible. Kherson is uh, destroyed every day. Every day killed people and destroyed. Just. Uh, um, just uh, civilian people, yes. you, you, and time for time, you just you don't read this in the news because it's the norma. It's the norma that people killed in Kherson to to women and men. Okay, and you skip. Next day, three people killed in village near Kherson, and you skip still. Again, you, I think it. We cannot. Maybe it's just my opinion. We cannot understand how terrible and how big is it. And that's why I tell that we will cry so long and so much. Uh, but maybe if about me, when, when I stop, <laughs> uh, maybe I started to play piano. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is my little dream. So I, li I started, yeah, I, sta I started to play before I was mobilized, before I came to this, to, to the army. So, um, find the teacher and start it again. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, 
Yeah, I would like to uh, open the discussion. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask all of them. It's not a question, but some words from me. Uh, my name is Alexandra, and I, I'm here to support my friend, uh, the uh, Ukrainian actress Irma Zubina, and all Ukrainian team. And uh, I'm I'm so happy to be here and to be a participant of this great event in Berlin. And you know, uh, the special thank thank you to Roman Bondarchuk because uh, I like this film very much, despite of this difficult subject of it, uh, raising this film. But um, the, I would like to, to tell you about my uh, feelings at the final version, final scene of this film, when there was uh, written uh, on the screen, six months after our victory. And you know, I live in Kyiv and uh, sorry. And I believe that we will win, like uh, these main heroes planted these trees. We will rebuild our sorry, our destroyed country, and we will plant a lot of trees, and our country will be the best in the world like it is. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. And I can only say I hope that um, this country, Germany, and the rest of the European Union will uh, continue to support and hopefully do more because it's, it's really needed. We talked about a difficult situation. Any any other questions? Uh, it can be everything. It can be about everyday life in Kherson or in the Ukraine. It can be about the future of the war. It can be about personal stories of, of, of Roman, of, uh, of, of the other uh, panelists. So uh, feel free to ask whatever <laughs> you want. <laughs> Maybe because of your answers. <laughs> Thank you. I have two, two quick questions. First one is, um, in the film, we see the groundhog in the photograph when Yura is photographing this oil pipe ceremony. I want to know if Yura sees the groundhog in the, in the, in the picture as well, or is this not clear? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Well, uh, it was a groundhog, but what was your question? Uh, so, when the, when he is uh, photographing the yeah, yeah, I remember the scene, of course. There's a there's a there's a groundhog in the picture. Yeah. Does Yura see this? Of course, that's okay, why. Okay, I missed that. Okay. He's leaving the the ceremony in search for for this groundhog. Okay. That's something which attracts him much. Uh, bigger than the ceremony and the job of, of journalist. Okay, sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that. The other, the other question was, maybe you have some until the our governments provide more support. Maybe you have some suggestions where people here could uh, donate to send uh, the the unit of uh, Dmitro. It's always a good idea to support them. They 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 always losing their vehicles and uh, even the the simplest uh, uh, tools and ammunition is always needed. Dima, maybe you can tell the yeah, list. So and sorry, uh, the sorry, maybe yeah, maybe it's not it's not so popular. But uh, the better support of Ukraine, it's not support civilian, it's support army, because if we not support army, Russian will come. So. It's no no reason will 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 be no reason to support civilian under Russians. Um, need yeah. What I need, yeah, and, and we need everything. <laughs> can, can, can you tell how if if um, like one of our guests Sorry. wants to donate or wants to support, how could they, for example, support your battalion or your brigade? How is this possible? Uh, few ways. Uh, 
simple way you can send money on my bank account. So uh, you can believe me, uh, it's, it's just my word, but uh, uh, that uh, I will. Uh, Ima is appointed as a fundraiser for his unit. Yes, so that's yes, why yes. He is and like I'm, uh, um, I'm. He um, always reports, and that's why he. It's it's all very transparent. <laughs> I'm a shooter medic, uh, so uh, time for time uh, I, I need to buy some spritz. Uh, yes, just medical equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Med medical equipment because it's quicker to go to uh, apteka, Ph pharmacy, and buy. Uh, it's not a problem of my brigade. We have a lot of a lot of and so much what we need but it's just a quicker when you when uh, you just need to go uh, today is night and you don't have something you you, you should buy it and uh, we need so much i mean something like power bank or television or uh, this stuff uh, which w <coughs> which what you can maybe see in the sorry, night. Sorry, Dima. Uh, maybe we can leave some flyer at the exhibition how to contact Dima or maybe... It was one way. Yeah, uh, other way you can... I can give you my contacts and um, uh, some card or co uh, this of brigade uh, number, number of card, this the same. So the different way Different way. So maybe whoever wants to support uh, can maybe just go directly in contact with with him after uh, our panel here. You had a question. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, I haven't seen the film yet, so um, uh, now I'm watching constantly this scene here, and I'm wondering about what it is actually showing. And this, um, it looks like there's a ceremony going on, and I was wondering if this is like a um, you know, when uh, when the women walk around with these well, well, on the, their head? The, the, this yeah. installation is, is mainly about the place because the whole exhibition uh, is about the places and people uh, we uh, casted for this film. And uh, the, this place is an eco settlement uh, which uh, was built in uh, uh, Oleshki, it's on the left bank of, of uh, Dnipro River. And uh, uh, up there you can see 10 or 11 takes uh, for the film. It's not connected, it like, doesn't matter what, 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 uh, what is the story about, but it's a matter that uh, you can see the echo settlement. And down there is um, the same path, how it looks like uh, now. So it's, it's just... Uh, um, future uh, and uh, present or past and present if you like so the, the when russians invaded they burned it down just for fun because they could and uh, it was such a nice uh, place a little, uh, a little more about uh, uh, question before <laughs> sorry uh, and for my brigade and for whole uh, forces, we need heavy we heavy vehicles. Yes, heavy vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, maybe it's one of the way just to explain um, to government or to people which are can can help some to to give us more because uh, it's it's the problem too. For example, in Avdiivka was the problem big <laughs> we need more a lot of maybe maybe the manifestation yes but uh, I can maybe add from from my perspective I'm in touch with like a lot of battalions and brigades because of my work and I, I can tell you that almost every second day I get like an, a message uh, with like the request for help because they don't have a vehicle or they miss a drone because it's damaged so the destruction is so heavy and so intense that uh, all these brigades they they are yeah they, they need help from from outside they can't do it with like 
like all of it from from the money coming from the own army so um there are a lot of ways and um i mean you can get in touch with me i can send you some fundraising uh platforms i know uh too so if there are any um also humanitarian uh, organizations in ukraine you want to you want to support so feel free to contact any other questions Uh, hello, Nasasek Anivetsky Notata magazine. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for this film. Uh, now we have a political and uh, social satire which we needed so badly. Thank you for that. It's very, very uh, important cinema. And my, qu my question is, um, could you tell in detail um, how the lo local authorities perceived the shooting process, um, um, whether they wanted to interfere, in, in, in interfere somehow, or maybe you got some support from local volunteers, for example, because uh, volunteer work is another very, very important issue of the, uh, of the film. Thank you. No, no we, we couldn't meet uh, the, the, the mayor of Kherson back then. He um, couldn't have time to, to meet our uh, uh, crew, So, but we perfectly managed to, to film without uh, any meeting. Uh, some local um, officials they they saw the pictures uh, from the set uh, on some social medias and uh, some of them were upset because they recognized themselves uh, dancing uh, during their election campaign. Uh, so we had some people who were really like angry on us. Uh, but uh, the, the the people in this um, uh, workshop uh, in a film where they saw this camouflage nets and where they pack in the, the drones, so they are all real, so they are uh, real volunteers who are contributing to Ukrainian army since 2014. And the guy on the wheelchair, he's a very famous um, volunteer, uh, his name is uh, Grigori, and he managed to raise millions of hryvnias for Ukrainian army, and he even decided to stay under occupation, and he still, uh, he was like, he was on, on the, the, the central market, having this Bluetooth speaker with Ukrainian autumn on it, and he was writing the money uh, for Ukraine being under occupation. Of course, the, it, it was like for a few weeks and then uh, some friends of him uh, decided to bring him out to Mykolaiv, but still he is a very brave man and um, we were more in contact with the um, volunteers than with the local authorities. Are there any other open questions? You can, uh, so you can see this election dance, which Roma said on this laptop. Yeah, this real uh, election dance, it uh, was maybe 2019, it's <laughs> so funny. It was very fashionable uh, to dance and uh, the, um, like everyone did that. So that, that's why uh, every official could recognize himself in, in this film. Super. So, uh, last chance. Any open question? I th don't see any hand. So, thank you very much thank to you. all of you. Thank you for being guests tonight. And yeah, feel free to see and follow the exhibition.